We are now to chapter 10, which starts with solutions. Solutions are mixtures of materials. Mixtures come in two types. There are heterogeneous mixtures. These are not uniform, meaning the properties vary with where you take the sample. An example would be a root beer float, which would have lumps of ice cream on top and less ice cream on the bottom. A sip from the top would give you more ice cream. A sip from the bottom would give you more root beer. Another example might be pulpy orange juice. If you purchase pulpy orange juice and you forget to mix it up before pouring yourself a glass, that last glass you drink might as well be an orange. The orange juice will be less concentrated in pulp on the top than on the bottom. Homogeneous mixtures are what chemists like to deal with because they are uniform. So every sample is the same, regardless of if you take it from the top or bottom of the container. Dr. Pepper would be a homogeneous mixture or apple juice. Homogeneous mixtures have two parts, the solute and the solvent. The solute is the substance being dissolved, so it is present in the smallest amount. The solvent is the substance doing the dissolving, so it is present in the largest amount. Many times students believe the solute must be a solid and the solvent a liquid. There can be many combinations. For example, a soft drink does have solid sugar in the liquid water. But another of the solutes is the dissolved carbon dioxide gas. Air is a solution of oxygen and other gases in nitrogen. Sterling silver is solid silver with a little bit of solid copper as the solute. Vinegar is a liquid in liquid mixture, liquid acetic acid in liquid water. Solutes have concentrations. There are actually a number of different concentration units. In this class, we'll work with molarity, which is represented by capital M or units of moles per liter. I believe you saw this in the gas law chapter. Molarity represents moles of solute per liter of solution. So if one were to ask, what is the molarity of methanol in a solution which contains 64 grams of methanol in 4 liters of water? First, we'll start by taking the ratio that we're given, 64 grams over 4 liters. We need to convert that to moles per liter. So I trust you realize that we will just have to divide by the molar mass or multiply by 1 over the molar mass. It's the same operation. You notice that grams of methanol cancel out. We are left with the units that we want, moles per liter. This turns out to be 0.5 molar. And we would represent the concentration in square brackets. So you might read this, the concentration of methanol is 0.5 moles per liter. Here's another example. What is the molarity of a typical soft drink based on the sugar content? If you look at a can, you will see that there is typically 39 grams of sugar in 330 mils of your favorite non-diet soft drink. Once again, we'll put the two numbers that we have in the ratio. We've got two issues here. Grams are on top and milliliters are on the bottom. To get rid of grams, we'll divide by the molar mass. That will cancel out our grams of sugar. To get from milliliters to liters, we'll need to use this conversion factor with 1,000 milliliters on top and one liter on the bottom. Milliliters will cancel out. We're now left with units of moles per liter. So the concentration of sugar in that soft drink is 0.35 molar. Here is your first student question. Vodka is 35 volume percent alcohol. 
which means it is approximately 27.6 grams of ethanol in 100 mils of solution. What is the ethanol concentration in vodka? We'll start by writing our ratio of 27.6 grams of ethanol divided by 100 milliliters. Now we need to convert to moles and liters. If you're not sure how to do that, move the video back one slide and you'll see the example. For the concentration of ionic materials, we need to do a little thinking because ionic materials are composed of cations and anions. If one starts with magnesium perchlorate solid in the bottom of a solution and mixes it up to get it to dissolve, it breaks apart. We get a magnesium 2 plus cation and two perchlorate anions. So three pieces come from our one piece. Visually, that should look like this. Everything is now separated and surrounded by water molecules. Suppose you had 11 moles of the magnesium perchlorate in 4 liters of solution. Well, remember that even though we're doing concentrations, stoichiometry and coefficients are important. Notice the ratio of coefficients is 1 to 1 to 2. So if we start out with 11 moles in 4 liters, this will produce one piece, so that would be 11 moles. The perchlorate would be two pieces, so that is 22 moles. The volume does not change at this level of chemistry when you dissolve something, so the bottom is still 4 liters. If I take 11 divided by 4, that winds up to be 2.75 molar magnesium perchlorate, which has separated into 2.75 molar magnesium 2 plus cation and 5.5 molar perchlorate ion. If I add these two together, I have 8.25 molar ions, meaning I'm counting both the cation and the anion amounts. So a chemist may say, I have a 2.75 molar solution of magnesium perchlorate. What they really mean is it broke apart, there's cations, there's anions, they have their stoichiometric ratio of concentration. A very useful formula is volume times concentration equals moles. So this question asks, how many moles of aluminum nitrate are required to make 500 mils of a 0.1 molar aluminum nitrate solution? If labs were in operation, this type of solution preparation would be occurring in our stockroom on a daily basis in order to make solutions for lab experiments. Remember that volume times concentration equals moles. So here are my moles, 0.1 molar per liter, and my volume is 500 mils, which is 0.5 liters. Multiplying this out tells me that I need 0.05 moles of aluminum nitrate. If we change the question to ask how many grams are required, well, we already have the molar amount, so this is just a matter of multiplying by the molar mass. You would need to take 10.65 grams, which you weigh upon the balance, and add it to water and fill the container up to contain 500 milliliters. Here is your student question. You are throwing a beach party and you want to be authentic. So you decide you need salt water in your swimming pool, which you're on a student budget, so this is one of these tiny 700 liter swimming pools. Now seawater can be approximated by having a sodium chloride concentration of 0.6 molar. So how many grams of sodium chloride do you need when you go to the grocery store to buy your salt? Remember that volume times concentration equal moles. Once you get to moles, then you can get to grams. Once you work this out, you'll realize you need an extraordinarily large amount of sodium chloride. 
This might explain why it's so difficult to get fresh drinking water from seawater. I'm going to set you up for another student question by now looking at individual parts. Here's an example where we want to know what are the concentrations of aluminum 3 plus, nitrate, and total ion when 0 0.02 moles of aluminum nitrate are dissolved in 500 milliliters of water. First, what is the stoichiometry of this reaction when it dissolves? Aluminum nitrate makes one aluminum 3 plus cation and three nitrate anions. Please remember that the stoichiometry is one to one to three. So if I begin with 0.02 moles of aluminum nitrate, when it dissolves, I'll have 0.02 moles of aluminum 3 plus cation and three times or 0.06 moles of nitrate anion. If I divide by the volume, which is 500 milliliters or 0.5 liters, the volume isn't going to change upon dissolution. So working this math, I have 0.04 molar of the aluminum, and working this math, I have 0.12 molar of the aluminum. I feel like there's a quicker or easier way to do this, though, and that's to find the original concentration and then apply the stoichiometry. The original concentration, if this were to dissolve without breaking apart, would be 0.04 molar. That's what you get mathematically when you take 0.02 divided by 0.5. The stoichiometry is 1 to 1 to 3. So I know that my aluminum concentration will be the same, and my nitrate concentration will be three times that value. I feel like that's one less mathematical operation. This method requires three calculations to get your answer. Divide, multiply, multiply. If we go the other route, we have multiply, multiply, and then divide, divide. So that's four operations. I really feel like it's easier to get the non-broken apart concentration and then multiply. What about total ion present? Well, certainly I could add the cation and anion amounts to get that value. I could also think about the fact that this breaks apart into four pieces. So if I took 0.04 molar and multiplied it by 4, I could get 0.16 molar. I feel like either way you want to do this is the same amount of work. You can add or you can multiply. It's one step either way. So now, here is your student question. I will help you out by writing the dissolution reaction. Although you're only a few lectures away from being responsible for that yourself. All right, there you go. And if you are confused, please back up one slide and view that presentation.